Hi, and welcome to the webinar Training System Coordination Advocacy on behalf of all victims with Dusty Olson. Dusty is the Advocacy Coordinator at the Providence Intervention Center for Assault and Abuse, and this training is being offered in accompaniment to the Child Sexual Abuse and Assault Advocacy Guide from Hurt to Hope. It's all yours, Dusty. Thank you. When we set out to write the Advocacy Guide from Hurt to Hope, the idea was that this was a guide based on best practices, not necessarily what's happening in all programs, um, not necessarily what's even always happening in the programs of those people that chose to write it, but what ideally we would like to have happen. And as I talk about systems coordination today, uh, that's the same concept. This is ideal. Uh, recognizing that not all these opportunities that I'm going to talk about today may be present in all communities um, and that not all programs start out with uh, exceptional relationships. So we're going to talk a little bit about the relationship building process today. As we talk about systems coordination, it's important to remember that, that systems coordination is a service standard that is provided to us as a requirement of participation with the Office of Crime Victims Advocacy. So the service standard for systems coordination includes a couple of really important key concepts that we need to keep in mind as we work through the presentation today. The first is that the general definition of systems advocacy developed by the service standard is that systems advocacy involves developing working relationships and agreements with service providers who work with sexual assault and abuse victims. So the idea is that the working relationship and is the goal. So having a good working relationship is the goal. Sometimes that's really formal with things like agreements in place. Sometimes it's more informal with just understandings or things that are happening on the ground. Uh, but the positive working relationship is the goal of systems coordination. The reason that we do systems coordination is that it ensures that clients have access to victim-centered services. So we know historically, in the reason the advocacy field developed was that service providers like law enforcement or medical providers may not have had the most victim-centered practices. So advocates needed to be really active in fighting for their clients so that they were treated well and treated respectfully. Now, certainly there's been a lot of evolution over the, the time of the sexual assault movement, and there are a lot of specialized providers in every one of those areas. So the adversarial nature of advocacy has changed a little bit. But our goal is still to make sure that those services that clients come in contact with as a result of their assault maintain a victim-centered perspective. And while that happens much easier and a lot more often these days, it's certainly still not a guarantee. So the idea behind systems coordination is that we can make sure that those systems and services which clients come in contact with have a victim-centered approach as much as we can possibly facilitate. Another goal of systems coordination is to make sure that we are representing the rights and perspectives of victims. So sexual assault victims don't have the opportunity to sit at the table with leadership in law enforcement or leadership in CPS or leadership at a hospital. Uh, they're not invited to those tables. The idea of systems coordination is that as an advocate, we can go and participate in those types of forums and represent their perspective, represent uh, their ideas, their experiences, and provide them with a voice in that situation that they would not have otherwise if we were not engaging in this activity. One of the most important things to be aware of when we look at the service standard for, for systems coordination is not that OCVA simply says that we need to do this. It specifically lays out in the standard that we should be, as a CSAP, should be taking a leadership role. So we need to be actively bringing people to the table if they're not. We need to be chairing committees. 
we need to be uh, developing these opportunities. We need to be out and present in a way that is not merely a participant, but is an innovator and an activist and a leader. So it's not enough to say, I attend these task forces. Really, we have to show that we are actively taking a leadership role in our community. And that, I think, is a really important piece around when we talk about, in a little bit, making the argument for the time and energy that this takes. It takes more time to chair a task force than it does to participate. But when we look back at this, this, the service standard specifically says that we should be taking a leadership role, that argument's already made for us somewhat in the in the context of this is a, what we are supposed to be doing. There we go. So I know how busy programs are. I know how busy our program is. It's difficult when you have limited staff and limited resources and everybody's busy and you operate in a crisis mind frame where you are putting out fires all day long, that it's very hard to look at something on your calendar that is a meeting and prioritize that or prioritize a request to get involved with another task force or another committee over client needs. And I think that the best way to get over that weighing of which is more important is to remember that systems advocacy is advocacy for victims. It's advocacy on behalf of all victims, all victims that are occurring now and all potential future victims, because it is the piece of our work that impacts the experience of victims with other providers. And it, it's important to think of it as really a direct client service, that going to this task force or going to this meeting, if you are being active and you are participating, is a service to your clients. It's not recorded in quite the same way, but it is recorded. Um, it is something that, that does count um, towards our agency's services. Um, so being able to really look at it as a direct client service for virtual clients, let's say, um, all the clients you're working with, all the clients, all the other advocates in your agency are working with, and even, I'd like to think about the clients that don't actually come to see us. So we all know that there are a lot of sexual assault victims uh, or abuse victims that don't ever access our services. But systems coordination and working with our partners to develop victim-centered services assists them even if they don't ever access a service from our agency. So really being able to look at it is this is not an activity that takes away from our client services, but enhances them, enhances services for clients that don't ever even come to see us, assuring that they had potentially a positive experience, even if we're not there to be a direct support to them. And in that way, it makes it a little easier to say, you know, I'm not available to do this other thing because I have to I have to attend this meeting. Um, doesn't mean that you're always going to prioritize uh, a meeting or an appointment over a direct client service, but if you can come to a position where in your mind they have the same weight, the same value. Uh, and I would argue that systems coordination in a lot of ways has a much more far-reaching value. <clears throat> now, what a lot of people will tell me in this discussion is, I'm engaging in systems advocacy and systems coordination every day. Every time I'm with a client and I'm talking to an officer about that client's rights, or I'm talking with a medical provider about 
um, being sensitive to a victim's circumstances, that I'm engaging in systems advocacy. And in a way, that's true, uh, but that doesn't negate the idea for stepping out of that individual client service to also engage in systems advocacy. Because if you only engage in systems advocacy in the context of an individual client, you limit your ability to truly achieve far-reaching effects, and there's some potential challenges with that. If you are working with an individual client and a police officer, for example, is treating them poorly and you address that, there's potentially, it's important to do that, but there's potentially some consequences with that around um, territorial issues, uh, the officer being offended, uh, them taking it personally, and you're usually just addressing issues specific to that case because you're working with an individual. So you are addressing maybe something that that particular officer is doing or that particular police department, or maybe it's only something that's related to that particular victim. So you're likely to have some more um, pushback from that, from the individual, because they're they're taking it personally that you're concerned about the job that they're doing. They consider their role to be very important and that this is actually their client as well. And you may really just be addressing one particular issue at a time. Now, it doesn't mean that that's not important to do, but that in and of itself is not enough to constitute you participating in systems advocacy, particularly because when you're working on a client level with a police officer or a CPS worker or a medical provider, whoever it may be, um, you're also working maybe on the front line level. And that person may not be an authorized decision maker for that agency. So if you have a police department that you're having a particular struggle with and you are working on a case with an officer and you talk with him or her about your concerns and they kind of come around, let's say, and adopt your philosophy, that doesn't mean that you're having any impact with any but any other officer in that department or any other department in that jurisdiction. So you, you're likely not working with somebody at that level who really can be an impactful decision maker for that agency. I know that right now we are all trying to do more with less, uh, see more clients with less people, uh, see have the same number of people with smaller budgets. So we're all trying to do more with less, and that gets difficult. So when you look at why it makes sense or where it makes sense to spend your resources, sometimes systems coordination can be a hard sell. Uh, like I talked about, if you have clients that are waiting at your door to come in and see you, uh, it's hard to prioritize a task force or a, a meeting. Or if you have limited staff resources in your agency and somebody new comes and says, you know, we really like you to chair this task force, we really would like you to, to be involved in this committee, uh, when you have limited resources, it can be easy to say no. I would challenge you that it's important, particularly in times of limited resources, to say yes. Um, when you are involved in systems coordination, the goal, like I talked about at the very beginning, is better professional working relationships. Advocates who are involved in this activity know people. They have contacts. They're able to call up the sergeant of a police department or the supervisor of a CPS unit or um, the head of the same program because they've worked with them, they've interacted with them, they're comfortable talking with them on a professional level outside of a client situation. So therefore, when there is a situation that arises, it's easier to address. Uh, a good example, when I first came into my program, there was some animosity between advocates that worked in the community and advocates that worked at the prosecutor's office, so community-based versus system-based advocates. And I know a lot of communities kind of struggle with that. 
um, because people from the outside think an advocate is an advocate is an advocate, and their roles are really different. So looking at that relationship, so their uh, supervisor and myself actively worked for quite some time to develop a good personal working relationship between him and me when I first came on board. Uh, about six months after I had been in, in my position, there was a concern about uh, a client and the advocacy interactions and a lot of pieces. And it was a lot easier to address that concern because we had a good professional relationship. It was much easier for me to call somebody that I had worked with a lot that knew me well We'd, we'd only worked one actual case together, but we had, had worked together consciously on other things to coordinate our services. And it was much easier for him and I to talk through this issue that arose because of that. If we'd not had that background, um, and I was still the new person that he didn't really know, and there had the animosity that had kind of been there when I came on board had not been addressed at all, it would have been much more difficult for us to address this client issue that arose than if we didn't have that in place. So building those professional relationships allows for better client services. Um, systems coordination advocates participating in systems coordination also increases their awareness of resources and referrals in the community. Uh, I've been in my position for nine years and um, and this work for 15, and I still find when I am at systems coordination activities that I learn about new services in my community or I learn about um, new initiatives that age, other agencies are trying or taking on that I may not have known of if I had not been active in participating in those events and activities. Uh, it's important for us as advocates to know about as many uh, depths and breadths of resources in our community as we can because we know that not all resources fit all victims. And victims often come to us with a lot of issues outside of their victimization that if we can provide a co appropriate community resources, we can help address that. And being involved in systems coordination activities helps with that, both formally and informally. <coughs> I talked about systems advocacy in the context of cases often being about addressing challenges that are a result of that case. If you engage in good systems advocacy outside of individual casework, formal processes and agreements that are developed can help reduce those case-specific challenges. So, for example, one of the things that has occurred in our community is that we were finding that one of the challenges that was occurring between ourselves and law enforcement was that victims often wanted their advocate or an advocate to be present at their law enforcement interview, but they may not know when that interview is scheduled until the day before or a couple days before, and then they would call us and say, this is when my interview is, and sometimes we wouldn't have anybody available. And so then the victim would want to reschedule because they would want their advocate and the detectives would get a little annoyed because now we're rescheduling interviews around our schedule. And so one of the things that developed out of uh, a task force and a discussion about victim-centered practices is the idea that we would um, have advocates on call to respond to law enforcement interviews in the exact same way that we have advocates on call to respond to emergency room cases. And putting that process in place in cooperation with the police department has reduced the challenges associated with individual cases and people getting frustrated that they can't get their advocate present or that they're rescheduling interviews because the advocate's not available. And we've greatly reduced the case-specific challenges because of an agreement and a process that we put in place at a task force meeting. The best argument, however, um, for 
engaging in systems coordination activities it really goes back to what I talked about, about the advocacy for victims. This is a service for victims, and victims receive better services as a result of systems coordination. So being able to say that they are services for victims and we see the benefit of these services for victims is the number one reason to prioritize this even when we have limited resources. And then the flip side of that is, because we have limited resources, we know that we are not going to be able to be all things to all people uh, in this climate, and probably maybe not ever again, um, even if we ever were. So developing these relationships, knowing that other providers in the community have client-centered or victim-centered services and trusting in the services that clients are going to get, um, allows us to be more comfortable to allow other providers to meet clients' needs. So knowing that if an advocate's not able to be available um, at an individual appointment that has to happen that day, knowing that that provider is, is victim-centered because of the work that you've engaged in in systems coordination, uh, it's a, knowing that it's going to be a quality service, whether or not an advocate is there to ensure that, um, knowing that there are therapists in the community or uh, other providers in the community that have good knowledge and understanding of victim dynamics so that they can, you can be referring to, comfortably referring to providers in the community to meet client needs that we're not able to. <clears throat> so now that you've made the, the sale for we should be doing this as an agency, who is it in the agency that should be doing it? Um, often I have seen the idea that when people are new at an agency and maybe they don't have a big client caseload yet or, or they still seem to be getting their feet wet, is often when people get involved in these types of things. Well, I don't have time to go to this meeting, but I'm going to send, you know, Susie, who is less busy right now because she's still getting up to speed, I'm going to send her. Um, it'll be good for her to get to know things. And some of the arguments that I made about understanding resources and building good professional relationships, it seems intuitive to make sense that a new person should do those things. However, I think it's particularly important that systems coordination activities are engaged in by experienced and knowledgeable advocates. They have to be really comfortable in their role. Their job in systems coordination activities is to speak on behalf of victims. So they have to be knowledgeable to do that. They have to have lots of um, on the ready case examples. They have to be confident in their role. Uh, a good example of a systems coordination activity um, I was sitting on a, a services task force with providers addressing services for kids in our community through our Children's Advocacy Center. And we meet weekly and we talk about cases and then we look at how services can better be developed to address case issues and those, those types of things. And the provider, um, a, a prosecutor in our community, and this is a prosecutor who specializes in prosecuting cases around sexual assault brought forward a case and was discussing the challenges with the case in the context, the context of being difficult because this victim was a young man, um, overcoming the idea that uh, how do you rape a guy, uh, how do you physically rape a guy, how guys are supposed to want to have sex, lots of really stereotypical male rape myths uh, that we encounter. And the gist of the conversation was, was really concerning to me because if these experienced providers in the room are struggling with these rape myths, how is it that we're making any progress in the community? So as the discussion evolved, I finally called that out and said, you know, I'm concerned. I'm concerned about what I'm hearing about the inability um, to perceive that a, a guy can be raped. I'm concerned about the, the stereotypical discussions that I'm hearing, um, and I, I just want to call that out. And 
um, have a discussion around that. That was a professional risk to do. Uh, these are colleagues of mine. Um, I was very forthcoming in my concerns. A new advocate who didn't know everybody as well, who is questioning their role and their responsibility, who maybe hasn't worked with a lot of male clients, any one of those things may not have felt comfortable in that situation to speak that that truth and engage in that discussion and advocate on behalf of not only that individual male victim but male victims in general. And not that, that I don't think any advocate would have been a little unnerved by the discussion, but it takes a risk to sometimes engage in these and really assert ourselves in our role, and it's not fair to ask new advocates to do that. When I did that, there were other people in the room who said, yeah, I felt that way too, yes, that's what I heard too, but they hadn't felt comfortable enough to call that out, and being mindful of the fact that you're asking advocates potentially to take risks in these situations, you want them to be really comfortable with that role very experienced in their in their situation and knowledgeable about what they're talking about. So you don't want to use systems coordination as advocate training by itself. Now, it is incredibly useful to have new advocates go on to these types of activities for observation, for getting to meet people, for the knowledge, but not to be the active participant in the activity of representing victims. Until they are confident in their knowledge base, they would be comfortable to challenge other service providers and uh, be able to, to utilize their experience to bring to the table. So often we will have new advocates attend a lot of these systems coordination activities as an observer when they're training along with the experienced advocate who is the regular participant in the event. Now, then what happens is, you know, it, it comes to a situation where, well, because this is a decision-making body perhaps or because uh, other people are involved in more direct client services or for many number of reasons, the possibility exists that the majority of these activities then start to fall only to your director or your manager or your coordinator. <clears throat> and I would say that that's a disservice. So finding the balance between not wanting to use new people and only wanting to use leadership is important. Um, leadership may not, leadership in your organization, in small organizations it is, but in larger organizations that may not be the person with the day-to-day -day interactions as examples. It may not be the person who um, has a the time to attend all of these things. So looking at who's the best fit for what task force, there are certain ones that are really decision-making bodies that maybe it does need to be the leadership person um, or it needs to at least be somebody who is comfortable committing the agency with some guidance from the leadership to activities or events. But it shouldn't only be the, the staff, I mean the, the leadership. It should be the direct staff. We actively at our agency try to ensure that every staff member, once they're trained and, and fully um, knowledgeable in their role, participates in at least one or two regular systems coordination activities um, in, in any given month. So, uh, and some people have ongoing ones that are, you know, every month they do this or every couple of weeks they do this, and then some are short-term ones where it's a particular project that's being addressed or uh, a particular issue or, or conflict on a global level that needs to be uh, addressed. But this also is a good break from the day-to-day -day grind of our jobs to give us a, a breather and a, and a break. So now that we're all on the same page about the importance of doing this and who should be doing this, so how do you do this? Where, where do you find these opportunities? It's, it's important if we go back to that leadership piece about if there are not opportunities in your community, you should be creating them. Uh, the, the opportunities 
if you need to be calling people to the table because there's a gap, when you look at your community and say, here's a victim services gap that exists, or here's a victim-centered services gap that exists, or we're having this type of problem consistently, uh, maybe it needs to be your agency that is setting up this opportunity. One of the best ways to begin the process of looking at how to engage other professionals in this process so that you can, can develop better professional relationships with them is to be proactive, to seek them out. And I have found one of the best ways to get a another professional to be willing to engage in this type of context with you is to have you invite them to educate you. Um, very few providers will turn down the, the uh, opportunity to speak about their own program, to speak about their area of expertise, to educate other people about how they would like them to do things. So saying to a, um, a CPS supervisor, for example, that you would like somebody to come to your program to talk about how decisions are made around um, child placement issues, or you would like somebody to come to your um, advocate training to talk about uh, the intake process and how um, reports are made to CPS. So having the other providers come and educate you is a good start. It's also particularly important if you are just beginning to engage in the concept of developing child-specific services, which is what the, the guide is about, is, you know, a lot of what we have been talking about so far in this uh, training applies to systems coordination for any victim, uh, regardless of age. But as we look at uh, how to develop specific systems coordination around children's issues, if you are relatively new in your program to providing child-specific services, one of the best places to start is with them coming to educate you. And then a lot of opportunities can arise out of that. Um, a lot of a lot of the initial systems coordinations, particularly with child protective services, activities that our agency engages in, started as educational opportunities, both them training us and us training them. So inviting those people that you look at in the community and say, we need to have a better relationship with them, uh, making a concerted effort to begin that advocacy process with them, inviting them to come educate you is a really valuable first step. You also want to be strategic. Uh, you want to, as an agency, <clears throat> do some analysis about where you want to expend your efforts. Uh, we can't all of us be involved in every single thing. We don't have those resources. We have limited resources. We've discussed that already. So you want to be strategic about what you're choosing to be involved in. And so that means for our agency, as part of our strategic planning process, we will often identify some specific things that maybe don't exist that we want to exist in the community <clears throat> or specific service providers that we need to uh, develop that relationship with. Uh, but the most important part, really, honestly, about being strategic is knowing what everybody else is doing. Um, you want to make sure that your advocates know who's involved in what, because it can be uh, a little professionally embarrassing, for example, to um, commit to or, or contact a, a group and say, I really would like to be involved in this. I think our agency needs to have representation and then hear from somebody else that, oh, well, so-and-so from your agency is already involved in that. Or, um, you know, or the flip side, uh, there are some meetings that exist in our community that really are not worth the time. And so somebody, in, somebody new may decide that they want to start going to something uh, because nobody's going to it. And without talking to the other advocates um, or leadership in the in the unit, uh, don't know that we've attempted that before and really didn't feel that it was a good use of our time, uh, that it really wasn't the best fit for our agency. So making sure that 
people are talking to each other and know what advocates are engaged in what. Um, it's a good cross-training reference as well. Uh, we often have one advocate assigned to one particular act activity in our program, but we may have trained or know enough about what's going on to be able to fill in if somebody's not able to go, um, or that, that we're bringing back the knowledge and resources that we've learned uh, from engaging in the systems coordination activity to the other advocates on our staff. Because if you learn about something new, some resource that's new, and you, you don't share it with the rest of the staff, then the value of that has been depleted. So making sure that people are talking to each other is a big part of that value of getting your bang for your buck, per se. So, <clears throat> excuse me. As we talk about, you know, expanding and systems ad advocacy coordination specific to children's service providers, um, you'll have to you have to realize in a lot of communities there are not child sexual abuse specific providers. Um, there's not there like in our pro in our community we do have a therapy program that's specific to child sexual abuse, but a lot of places don't. So focusing more broadly on children's service providers is a good way to, to begin that. Um, for example, uh, I, uh, you can learn from a mistake that we made. We began a children's advocacy center in our community. Uh, we've been open for about three years now. So about five years ago, we began to have meetings about the development of a children's advocacy center in our community, and we worked as a task force for two years to develop that. And when we opened, immediately after we opened, at some point it was called to our attention that we had never brought to the table a program in our community that about 90% probably of cases that are working with Child Protective Services get referred to some service through this community agency. And because we were specifically thinking about abuse providers, and they they don't have that in their title. They do lots of other things. Um, we didn't really call them out. And that was probably, not probably, that was a mistake. So when we're looking at children's services, there are a lot of children's services that work with kids who've been sexually abused, that that's not their primary mission or focus. But they're seeing those kids. So children's mental health providers, um, programs like Big Brothers Big Sisters, or the Boys and Girls Club, or even even more generally like Girl Scouts or Boy Scouts. There's a lot of children's services providers that have a lot of interaction with kids that are coming across kids that have been abused. and maybe even a high percentage of their their children that they're working with have been abused. So when you're looking at these opportunities and creating these opportunities in your community, you want to think more global than just abuse providers uh, because there probably aren't a lot of those in your community. Even in my community that's a large community, there's not a lot of those beyond us. So thinking more outside of the box is particularly important when we're when we're talking about children's services. You want to take advantage of existing struct structures in your community. I'm going to talk a little bit more about some kids-specific things that, that are required to exist. But if there's something that somebody has already put together, joining is appropriate. Um, you don't have to start everything from scratch. There's no reason to reinvent the wheel. So making sure, finding out about what's um, available in your community, uh, getting on listservs, and even though we don't need more email to read, but finding out what those opportunities are is, is important. And then, like I said, if, if they don't exist in your community, then being leaders in making sure that they do, calling people to the table. Um, you know, our agency was an active leader in looking at the development of our Children's Advocacy Center. We've been an active leader in looking at the development of a vulnerable adult abuse task force, which isn't specific to kids, obviously. But um, being being a leader to say, you know what, we need to come together around this issue, and so I'm going to call the first meeting. 
Um, I'm going to invite those people that I think we need to work with around this issue. Um, everybody's busy. It's not always easy. You, you're not going to have everybody at the table every time, but being sticking to it and, and doing what's appropriate uh, is, is really good. Um, food helps. We all know that. Getting people to, to meetings it helps if you feed them. But you really want to take that leadership role in the community. Now, there are some ready-made opportunities for systems advocacy around children's issues. Uh, the first is your county protocols, and we're outside of a year uh, right now currently that county protocols are being reviewed. We just finished that process, but it happens every couple of years. And in some counties, they're really good about reviewing those regularly and really making their county protocol a living document. Um, our county's not like that. We review them when we have to, but we have a good thing in place here, so we don't really need to, to exist by it. So for those of you that don't know, county protocols are something that the legislature established that are protocols and procedures around how to handle or address child sexual abuse. Uh, this last revision also included procedures, had to include procedures to address serious physical abuse and child fatalities. And they are a document about a how-to, basically, that your county will handle child sexual abuse referrals and, and evaluations. So the prosecutor's office usually is the lead agency on those. Uh, CPS is involved. Um, this last time, uh, emergency medicine and schools needed to be involved. But the legislature also specifically requires that local advocacy groups are included. So hopefully somebody from your agency has already participated in that process as the statute dictated. But if you're not aware of it, you need to find it and read it um, and, and know what it is and then have it on your radar so that when it comes time to look at revising that or um, discussions about how it's going, that you or somebody from your agency is involved in that systems coordination opportunity. Uh, it's a very valuable one. Many, many communities now have multidisciplinary teams. Some of the county protocols wrote those in. Um, it was something that was actively encouraged uh, in the protocol process. So a multidisciplinary team is a group of providers who come together to discuss uh, client services, usually in the context of individual cases, but they're talking about that case not only to develop services for that case, but to assess gaps and develop service plans for all additional cases. Some of our best systems coordination activities come out of participating in our multidisciplinary team. Some of our agencies' uh, better protocols and policies have come out of um, issues that have been discussed at that, uh, at that table. Um, often, if you have a Children's Advocacy Center in your community, that's who facilitates that. If you don't, it may be the prosecutor's office. It may be um, some other service provider. Uh, but usually the, the prosecutor's office would be a good place to start because they're often uh, involved in those. So whichever unit in your prosecutor's office, if there are specialized units that handle crimes against children, would be a good place to start to find out about that. <coughs> Another opportunity is your uh, community protection team, which is a team that is uh, run by your local child protective services or your DSHS office uh, or DCFS office or however your county kind of uh, whatever acronym they use, but uh, community protection teams are required um, that DCF offices have those. Uh, how often they occur depends on how many cases. Um, in our county, there's probably nine of them. There's at least one every given week for different offices because we have four different um, DCFS offices in our county. But a child protection team is a group of professionals and community volunteers who come together, who staff cases for CPS. So whenever a case is being, um, there's certain requirements of cases that have to be staffed whenever a case is being closed, for example, 
whenever there's a child under the age of five, uh, there are certain requirements of cases that have to be staffed. And the social worker and their supervisor come in to uh, present information about the case. And there's often other people who present, like the volunteer guardian ad litem. Sometimes the parents are there or foster parents may be there. Um, they come and present and then they step out. And the team discusses the case and makes recommendations to the social worker about case closures, about services, about safety needs, those kinds of things. And it's very valuable to have a victim advocate participate on those um, so that they can provide victim perspective. But it's also one of the, in my opinion, the best ways to learn about child protective services and their decision-making process. So it really is a win-win for both CPS and the advocates in your agency. And those are required by statute. So the CPS office in your community has to have one of these. So that's a, a ready-made opportunity for an advocate to participate in. There's a process to do that. There's an application process and a background check. Uh, but it's an invaluable experience, and it allows um, – for the development of professional relationships between your agency and CPS workers, which is incredibly valuable when you're working with kids. It allows for knowledge. It allows for us to be sharing uh, the, the information about victim's response and, and victim behavior, those kind of things, and really about making good recommendations to social workers about services and, and resources that are available for clients in the community uh, it's a really valuable, uh, worthwhile thing. There isn't an advocate in our office that doesn't participate on one of these because we consider it to be such a valuable opportunity. Another opportunity that's available through DCFS is the family team decision-making meeting. Um, FTDMs are a, thing, a meeting that has come into place in CPS in the last couple of years about bringing everybody together from a case, uh, meaning everybody, meaning not only providers but family members and support members um, of a child to discuss from a strengths-based approach uh, the treatment plan or the placement plan, um, the safety plan for the child. A lot of times our advocates will participate in FTDMs as an individual case service as an individual client service. We're directly working with that client and their family that the FTDM is about. But it's also really valuable to use FTDMs as a broader systems advocacy opportunity for clients that we're not even involved with um, to be able to provide information about victim responses, to be able to provide information about standard um, services that are available in the community, to be able to um, help because uh, FTDMs are a big part of making decisions about cases, help caseworkers and social workers and supervisors really try to have a victim-centered approach. Uh, FTDMs are a little harder to participate in because they're not uh, routinely scheduled. So you don't know that, like, my, my community protection team is the third Wednesday morning of the month. I know that every month. FTDMs are more spur of the moment because they're, they're case-driven. So it is a little harder to have a single person who maybe would participate in those. So that's a good example of something where multiple advocates may be available at when, when the call from CPS comes in that one of those is going to happen, we throw out to the advocacy staff as a whole who's available because they are a little more sporadic and they are uh, certainly um, more spur of the moment for sure. Many communities in our state are working at developing or have recently developed child advocacy centers. Child advocacy centers is a model of service provision for child abuse victims um, with the idea that it's kind of a one-stop shop, that every provider that you would need either is there or comes there to provide services to children and their families to decrease the overwhelming uh, circumstance of running around all over town when you are faced with this traumatic situation of abuse of a child. Uh, 
child advocacy centers, if they're accredited by the National Children's Advocacy Center, are required to have things like multidisciplinary teams in place. So if you have a child, a child advocacy center in your community, I guarantee you have a multidisciplinary team, and that's something that would be important for a community-based advocate to, to be involved with. <coughs> if um, you don't have a child advocacy center in your community, there's a high likelihood that there's a group of people looking at the possibility of um, developing one. Uh, they really are have become the model for children's services, and so being actively in at the table in that process of what your children's advocacy center can look like and what you can do to, to be helpful and assistance in providing services there is a great place to be. Uh, we were actively involved of the development of our children's advocacy center in our county from the very beginning, and um, it's been a it's been a wonderful addition to our services and a wonderful opportunity to provide really conscientious children-centered services. So developing a good relationship with your children's advocacy center is vital. Um, it, particularly as we have a, a, a focus with uh, sexual assault services to increase our capacity to provide child-specific services. And then looking at existing task forces and coalitions. Do you have, um, does your county human services department have a children's services task force? I know ours does. Does uh, your local, um, are there things like uh, a youth services task force? Uh, we have one in our community that has a really broad array of providers on it. It's not specific to abuse. Uh, it's youth services in general, but it's very valuable for us to participate in that. Um, so finding existing task forces and coalitions that focus around children's issues that you can become involved with. And, you know, if you're really busy, you don't necessarily have to go to everyone every time. Uh, but making sure that whenever the agenda is something that is particularly relevant to, to child victims, that you're there with that voice. <clears throat> uh, as we wrap up, I think it's important to remember a couple of things. Our client confidentiality continues to apply. So if you are working on a systems coordination activity that is, for example, centered around a specific client, like a multidisciplinary team or an FTDM, or um, a child a community protection team, uh, you want to make sure that if your agency has provided services to that victim um, and there's not a release of information that you're not providing any client-specific information. Now, if you're engaging in systems advocacy, often what you're doing is providing general information about resources, about your program, about victim response, and you can do all of those things without a release of information. You can provide information on comma, trauma, and rea comma and trauma reactions. You can provide information about how to provide a victim-centered approach. You can provide information about good referrals and resources in the community. You can do all of that without a release of information. But if you're going to talk about specific case information that's specific to that victim, then you have to have a release of information. And that's where you've crossed over into providing more of a direct client service, but still in the context of a, a systems advocacy perspective. So you want to be careful about that. I know that when we participate in those activities, for example, that are client uh, case-based, we make sure that we look up whether or not there's releases for those clients, whether or not we've seen those individuals before. Um, that's not an option with something like the uh, community protection team, but it is with the multidisciplinary team because we know in advance the names of those clients that are going to be discussed. Um, and so we're all very careful about knowing when we do and don't have releases, and, and you have to know who's at the table. Um, you know, often in working with a child victim, for example, we may routinely have a release for CPS and law enforcement, but we go to that particular meeting and sitting at the table is also an administrator from the school, and we don't have a release for that person. So the information that we present at that 
uh, meeting is much more general because we don't have a release for everybody at the table. So you have to be very aware of that when you're engaging in these activities because a lot of them are around client issues and client staffing. And you want to make sure that in all contexts, we are protecting our clients' confidentiality when we're engaging in these activities. I think as a wrap-up, just to, to recap, going back to the very beginning and the, and the name of the presentation, systems coordination activities really are advocacy activities. They really are advocacy services for our clients and not just your client that you're seeing now, but every client that your agency is seeing and every client that you will see in the future, and probably most importantly, every client that you don't see. So working to engage in these activities is a valuable asset to victims in your community and really is deserving of the time and attention that we are conscientious to pay to all of our client services. And putting the same thought and effort and importance and value on these activities is not any different than making sure that your advocates are properly trained to provide any direct client services. It's really not any different than making sure that your staffing is adequate to cover your hotline and anybody who walks into the office assuring that staffing is adequate to cover these meetings and to make sure that victims' voices are represented represented throughout your community with all the opportunities that are available to them is an important part of what we do. Thank you.